All right, good morning. I, I decided to change the order around. We're going to go over chapter 17 first. And after we get done, um, then I'm going to go over, for those of you who don't know how to use a product like MobiRise, how you can download it and use it, okay? So chapter 17, and again, virtually everything that we do after the break will be database-centric. All right, in other words, database-oriented. So let's just get into what a database is. And if, you know, you may know what it is already, you may not agree with every single definition, term, et cetera, that I give you because I don't typically take all the ones that are out of the book, although by and large, I agree with everything they say. All right, so it says there, before you can develop database apps, you need to become familiar with concepts and terms. In particular, you need to understand what a relational database is and how you work with it using SQL and ADO.net. Now, ADO.net, isn't really discussed in depth in this book until like chapter 24 or something like that. So we may look at that if we get time, but we'll go over some of the concepts that are used in there. The other thing I want you to realize is, yes, we are going to be talking in this class, we're going to be talking about SQL, SQL. Sometimes people call it SQL, sometimes they call it SQL. It stands for Structured Query Language, all right? And that's what we deal with, whether we're using a product like MySQL or MySQL or Access or SQL Server, that's what we're talking about in this class. Those of you who in fall will, will be taking the third class, the AWD 1111 class, it's been renamed as Database Driven Websites. In that class, we don't use relational SQL. In fact, we use a type of beta database rather that's called no SQL, all right? And rather than it being basically centered around relationships like this, it's centered around what are referred to as documents. Don't worry about it right now. It's no big thing, but I just wanted you to hear that. All right. So in this chapter, the author says at the bottom here, uh, they will he will um, illustrate concepts and terms using Microsoft SQL Server 24 data. 2014 database server. What I'm going to have you download, and if you say, I, I don't want to do that, well, technically you don't have to, but the product that I'm going to ask you to download today when we get into this, maybe at the end, I don't know, whenever it seems like a relevant time, a good time to do it, will be a product that will allow us to use MySQL. The database that we're going to use in our programs, I've got a copy of it that I've created both in MySQL and in SQL Server. And what you'll see as we go through it is they really don't look very different. All right, okay. So as we go through this, an introduction to client server systems, an introduction to relational databases, how to use SQL, and then you'll notice the last 10 pages or so is an intro to ADO.net. And I know I've said this to you before, but I just do want you to realize again, after the break, we've got five weeks left. Well, we're going through 17 today. I want to go through 18, 19, and 20 after the break, but I'd also like to touch on 23 and 24. That's five chapters in five weeks. You, what you should probably find is, I think after the break, we might only have, I think I told you this, one or at the most two more tests. You're also, the homework that I'm going to ask you to do is homework we're going to be doing together as a class because i want to make sure we've got time to go over this you know as well as possible it always works this way i mean i i don't feel that bad in that we've got 25 days after the break to go over this stuff i wish we had 40 but it's just the way that it works all right so they talk in here about clients and servers, and it's interesting because I used to teach a class at the school I used to be at that was called Client Server Programming. And we had a picture that looked a lot like this that you see right here. But the difference is back in that time, clients were virtually always either laptops or desktops. It's not the case today. That Those clients that they show could be laptops, could be desktops, but more often than not, our phones and our tablets, all right? I had a meeting here Tuesday afternoon. We had a, a meeting on, you know, in, make sure, making sure, you, were, you know, it was on inclusion. 
Okay, you don't have to even worry what it was about. But the point is that several of the people who were on the on the meeting were on their phones. All right, and that's how they were going through it. Now I went through it on this mainly for an eyesight reasons. All right, it's harder for me to see on a phone. That's all, especially with this mask on and these glasses. All right. So clients are basically, that's what you are. However, you're getting into the system. Server is a computer that's out there. So for instance, if you type in, you know, before you came here, if you ever typed in rankin.edu and you did it from your computer, your computer was the client. And when you hit enter, some Rankin servers, someplace in St. Louis answer, answered your request by bringing you back HTML that showed you the homepage of Rankin's website. All right, and that's what they're saying in here. The network is the cabling or the way that you know you can connect clients with servers. And again, when you think about it, I've said this before, the computers in this room are networked together. And I believe they're networked to the, 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 the big computer area that's back there as well. And the other room is done the same way. There is no actual connection between the computers here and the computers that are in St. Louis, as you'd probably guess. I mean, when you think about how much money that would cost to actually burrow underground and do something like that, it wouldn't be cost feasible, all right? The thing that's bad about that is, is quite often, if, if something goes down at the St. Louis campus, it can affect us here, all right? So as it says in a typical or simple client server system, the server is typically a high powered PC that communicates with clients either over a local area network where there is a physical connection or a wide area network where there's not a physical connection. All right. It says here a client server system can also consist of one or more PC based systems, one or more mid range systems and a mainframe system in a dispersed in dispersed geographical locations. Well, when you think about this and they talk about this being called enterprise systems or an enterprise system. You know, as an example, if I go out to Amazon right now, all right, you know, I, I have no idea, I'm not gonna do that, but if I go out to Amazon right now and I go over to books and let's just say I put in SQL, well, what's gonna happen? My request is going to go to some, some Amazon server someplace, all right? Probably once I go in there and make a request for books on, on SQL, it's probably going to go out to another server someplace else, all right? That said, those are the kind of servers that I'm able to interact with. But I'm willing to put money on it that Amazon also has servers that are just basically set up for their employees and for certain information that's private to Amazon. But when you put all that stuff in total, both the stuff that's available to me and the stuff that's not, that would pretty much constitute an enterprise system. All right. All right. So it says here, the client server components of a client server system. And it's kind of what I told you before, all right? They're making this look very simplistic. And again, I'm willing to bet you that more than 99 times out of 100, if you're a client and you are making a request, that request is not immediately going to a database server. That's going to another server that, that takes that request and sends it out to a database server. All right, it's more or less a controller type of server. All right, I don't think we have to talk anymore about that. So they do mention in here to store and manage the databases of a client server system. Each server requires what's called a DBMS. A DBMS, as it says there, is a database management system. All right, and it's basically, it's the way that allows you to both ask a database information, generate reports from a database, add information to a database, edit existing information from a database, remove information from a database, and just view information from a database. So you'll notice in here, and this is kind of important, it says the processing that's done by the DBMS is typically referred to as back-end processing. When I came here five years ago, what we taught here was first semester exactly what you're getting taught right now, all right? The second semester, exactly what you're in right now, the C-sharp class. The third semester, you learned ASP.NET, which was basically how to write web apps with C-sharp. 
And in the fourth semester, it was an Android class, as it is right now. And it is changed because in the third semester, the class you guys will be taking is called now Database Driven Websites. And we use JavaScript because you can use JavaScript on both the client side and the server side. So we use it basically a variant of JavaScript that's called Node.js. The reason I'm telling you that is the idea is you're able to do JavaScript both from the front end, which is what you guys did last semester, and what you guys will do next semester, and back end, which is what you will do next semester. All right. And the idea, in fact, sometimes it's called full stack processing because you're doing things on both the front end and the back end. And if that still confuses you, look at it this way. Typically, when you talk about back end, it's something that an end user never sees. And when you talk about front end, that's the view that the end user actually has. All right. So it says there the application software does the work that the user wants to do. All right. It says this type of software can be purchased or developed. There's really two basic types of software. There's application software and there's system software. Most system software involves writing code that will allow you to create operating systems or manipulate the operating system or manipulate the computer in some way. We don't teach that in this program. I mean, they do some of that work actually in the other program. So if you wanted to learn how to how do you know, more intricate work with operating systems, that's the program for you. All right. But again, what we do is application software. And that's that's really all we've done this semester and what we did last semester. Those of you who were in the class now, they mentioned the data access API and I've used API before. I've likened an API or an application program interface to a contract. And it's basically the software says, I will provide you these services under the proviso that you will use them the way that you're supposed to use them. That's where the contract part comes in. All right. So as it says, it provides the interface between the application and the database management system. In a way, the API is the interpreter because typically, you know, the database cannot talk directly to the program and vice versa. All right. So the API is the interface between those two. All right. So it says here, the application software communicates with the DBMS by sending SQL queries. And a query is what you think it would be. It's you asking the database for information. In fact, I probably have used this term before. Now, if I've not, you will hear it again and again. And that term is CRUD, C-R-U-D. And it stands for create, read, update, and delete. Now, the good news is when you are writing queries using SQ, SQL, rather, and you write update queries, you, you start with the word update. When you write delete queries, you start with the word delete. The other two, when you write create queries, you start with the word insert. And when you write uh, read queries, you start with the word select. And you'll see all that stuff as we go on in here. All right. It says there, when the DBMS receives the query, it provides a service like returning the requested data. In fact, typically that requested data that you ask for that it provides is called a result set. All right. It's just like if I, you know, if I was taking some kind of a simple survey in here, not even using a computer. And I said, hey, now how many of you are watching the NCAA tournament? Raise your hand. All right. And that'd be kind of what I'd be doing. All right. So it says they're in a client server system. The processing done by an application is typically divided between the client and the server. The more work you provide to the server, the less control you have. So a fat server means a thin client, but it means you've got less and less control. And the, the reverse is also true. The fatter the client, the thinner the server, but you're putting more and more work on the client machine. All right, depending on what software, et cetera, you're using, some are fat client, some are thin client, some are fat server, some are thin server. All right. It says they're in a file handling system. All the processing is done on the client. We're not doing that. So with a, a file handling system, 
you're talking about local storage basically on your machine. Here, we will have local storage, but what we could do is it would be totally possible for us to all use the same copy of, for example, my, my SQL. All right, the problem with doing that is if you were all accessing it at the same time and you all went to change the same stuff, whose changes would take effect? Typically, it's the last person to create, write, create, write their changes. All right. So here's an introduction to relational databases. Now, what's cool about this, look at the beginning of this paragraph. In 1970, all right, that's 51 years ago. How many things do you think were created 51 years ago in the information technology area that are still relevant today? I'd say not many. At that time, computers were as big as this room and they weren't as powerful as your phone. All right. But one of the things that has survived, has persisted over time, has been relational databases. And one of the reasons for that is they're fairly intuitive in nature. People can look at them and say, oh, that's not that hard. Again, in fact, and you'll start to see this hopefully today, if not today, more next week. Some of the stuff you might you might even turn around and say, this is the first thing in this freaking class that's made sense. All right, because I've had that happen before when people have said that to me. Man, I've, I've been kind of confused the whole semester, but this stuff totally makes sense. All right. Years ago, this is before any of your time. All right. But there was, there was a, a, a guy who, and maybe I've even said this story quickly to you guys before. There was a show on when I was your age, back or younger, I don't even remember, probably younger even. Was called American Bandstand, and at that time, you know, they'd bring in, in groups and they'd play their hit song, etc. The guy who ran the show, his name was Dick Clark. All right. In fact, you may have even heard the name Dick Clark's New Year's Rock and Eve. All right, that Ryan Seacrest now hosts on New Year's Eve. But the point is, Dick Clark was known as the father of rock and roll. Somebody asked him once. I was watching an interview with him. Were you the father of rock and roll? And he said, no, I like to think of, think of it as when rock and roll was born, I assisted in the birth. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is E.F. Codd, who was a mathematician, is kind of the father of SQL. All right. So it says there, we're going to be using a relational databases. As you'd probably guess, relational databases have to do with relationships. All right, and it's even more than that. It says this type of database eliminated some of the problems that had been associated with files and other database designs. One of the key things you want to do in here, as it says, you want to reduce data redundancy. You cannot eliminate totally data redundancy. We'll talk about that as we go on. But you want to keep it to a controlled minimum. Why? Well, just imagine, just let's just take this campus. And I don't know how many people are here, full-time students during, during the day, you know, in the, in the evening. Let's say it's 400 students. And there's seven programs, all right? Now, there's probably a good chance that if somebody was, you know, if we had different people keying in this stuff, and let's say they had to key in the program name, some people might, might type in application website development. Some people might type in AWD. Some people might type in application and website development. Some people might spell one or more of the words in there wrong. All right. But if we had to, you know, if, if, you know, it's not that bad with, you know, seven of you at two in the afternoon with nine people, that's not terrible. It wouldn't be that hard to change it. But imagine at the St. Louis campus, because they've got a lot more people in the program there. All right. You don't want cons inconsistency. So what you end up doing is rather than, Having, having me you know, or somebody else put in for all of you where you are as far as what program you're in, we, we, choose, we create what's called a table, and in that table, we might have them numbered, all right, for all the different programs. And number one, for example, if we did it alphabetically, might be application and website development. Then for all of you, we only have to put in a number one as far as the program that you're in. And we don't have to worry about there being any misspellings or anything like that. And that's one of the biggest reasons for doing this. 
There is so much inconsistency and has been over the years in databases that over time it's gotten more and more refined. All right. So as it says today, relational databases are the de facto standard for database applications. They're one of the de facto standards. All right. And as time has gone on, <clears throat> they've lost a little bit of their luster. And if you say, well, geez, why is that? You'll, it'll make more sense to you as we go on. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break away from this just for a second, and I'm going to give you a couple of my own definitions here. Good, bad, or indifferent. That should be big enough. Hopefully you can all read this from back there. But if I type in, if I ask you what's a character, all right, that's the smallest unit you can key in at one time on your computer. You know what, what I'm talking about. It's anything on the keyboard, all right? And if you use the Unicode character set, you can even type in stuff that's not on the keyboard, but it's a single character. So for instance, if I was putting me, you know, you know my three initials in, it would be the character J, the character P, and the character S, all right? Something like that. All right, then we have what's called a field. And that's one or more related characters. A field can be as small as one character. For instance, middle initial. That's a single character. All right. Then we've got a record. And a record is one or more related fields. Now, typically, if you're going to create a database, each record will have more than one field in it. And each field will have more than one character in it. But I'm just showing you it can be that small. All right. Then you've got a table, and that's one or more related records. Finally, you've got a database, which is one or more related tables. That's pretty much how it works, from smallest to largest. All right, so we will be working with databases in here. When we're working with databases, our databases will have multiple tables in them. Each of those tables will have multiple records in them. Each of those records will have multiple fields in them. And each of those fields will have multiple characters in them. All right. Now, I mentioned before that SQL, which again is, whoops, structured query language, And as they said, it kind of still is the de facto standard. The problem is when you create SQL, typically each one of the records, you've got to put in a value for every field that you've got in there. Even if it doesn't make sense, you put in a default value or something else. All right. And you might say, well, who cares? Well, it might be that if you're creating, let's say I'm creating a, a, a table on students that for one student, I might want to put in 10 pieces of information. But for another student, it wouldn't make sense. For instance, let's assume that either here or in St. Louis, we've got a student, all right, and that student is a foreign student. So they're here on a visa, so we've got to put a lot of information about them in there. Why would I want to put that information about you guys in there when it wouldn't make any sense? And that's one of the pitfalls, so to speak, of using relational databases is it's expected that if I say, hey, you know, that, that basically every field in here has got to have this, has something in this, a value in this field, then you have to do that. And I'm not really doing a great job of explaining it. It'll make more sense when you see it in action. All right. So hopefully there are no questions on this, but these are some of the terms, again, that you're going to hear. Now, it says the model is stored in one or more tables. Tables go by different names, all right? But it usually is table that you will hear. Each table is a two-dimensional matrix consisting of rows and columns. What I call the record, this book is calling a row. What I call the field, this book is calling a column. They're used pretty much interchangeably. In fact, even in the same book, 
The other thing too is when you talk about a record, yeah, records are also called rows and they're also called tuples, T-U-P-L-E-S. And that's a mathematical term, all right? And maybe I told you about this because I just found it funny. But years ago when I was working as a programmer at AT AT&T, I got a call one day and it was the first time I'd actually talked to somebody over the phone with a British accent. You know, and I, I can't do justice to the way he did it, but he goes, got a problem with you, with, with your tuples. And I had no idea what the hell the guy was talking about, because there they call them tuples, not tuples. And I was still, you know, I had never even heard tuples before. So I had no idea what he was talking about. All right. Okay. Now it says in practice, the rows and columns are typically referred to as records and fields, as I did. All right. Now it also says, that if a table contains one or more columns that uniquely identify each row in the table, those are what are referred to as a primary key. So I'm going to add one more thing in here. In fact, I'm going to take this one and I'm going to throw it way on the top. And then I'm going to come down here and say primary key. Hopefully what you noticed is all the words that I've been giving you other than character they're very small. The definitions are small. And this one's going to be two. That's it. Unique record identifier. Anybody to want to take a guess in here? Probably what your primary key is. What's one thing unique to every one of you in here? Yeah. A lot of times social security numbers are used. A lot of times here at Rankin. All right. Give me your rank and ID number is used. Guess what? Those are terrible things to use as a, as a primary key. Why? Because these should be what's called unintelligible. You know as well as I do, if somebody finds out your social security number, they can wreak havoc in your life. But if all I do is if I take each one of you in here and you're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's not that bad a thing if somebody finds out you're number four. But if they find out your social security number, could be bad. You say, oh, it would be bad if they found out my rank and ID number. It might be if they could get into the system and put in your rank and ID number and find out your social security number. So again, a primary key should be unintelligible. So if somebody finds out your primary key, there shouldn't be a whole heck of a lot you should do with it. All right, and what you're gonna find is typically you'd like a primary key to be one field. It can be multiple fields, but typically you want it to be one field. And usually that one field that it is, is called ID. Again, not mandatory that you do that, but that's typically the way it's done. And it's, it, it's also what's called an auto incremented field. So if I make Aaron here number one, then we get to Gabriel, it automatically will make him number two, Christopher number three, Gabriel, Number four, et cetera. All right, so it'll do that for us. <clears throat> now, if you've got two or more columns that make up your primary key, it's called a composite primary key, yeah. But it says there's also unique keys. So if I was going to store, not as a primary key, but if I was going to store social security number as a field, I would put a what's called a unique constraint for it, which would say, no two people can have the same primary key. I'm sorry, not, uh, the, the same uh, social security number. So again, you can have unique key constraints. So I would probably stick a unique key constraint for both social security number and for rank and ID number. All right. All right. Then there are indexes. You know what an index is. You know, again, if I said to you right now, what does, I don't know, grab a, what does constraint mean? You either look in a dictionary, or if it, you know, you want it in the confines of this book, you'd go look in the index in the back of the book. And that's the same way it works here. When you index fields, what happens is when you query a database, meaning you're asking it for information, all right, if, you've, if the field or fields that you are asking about have indexes on them, you get the results back faster. All right. The problem is every time you update the database, you must also update all of the indices or indexes. 
So having indexes can both help with database speed and hurt with database speed, especially having too many. All right, so here's an example. These are the kind of tables that we'll be working with. All right, and you'll notice they added product code in here. I, I'm not saying that's a terrible primary key. I'm not saying that it is. Because if I found out that it was two JST, is that really going to be that bad a thing? Probably not. But again, still, probably what we have in here, because these, this is a books database, and so these are all books, I probably would have just created a field called ID. So I would have had another field here that would have been one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. All right. But the way it is right now, you can see taking a look, if we just look at what's on our screen right now, we have what? One, two, three, four different fields. Not only that, you can look at these fields and know product code will probably be some kind of a string field, which is typically referred to in database language as a text field. All right. Description will be a text field. Unit price will either be a decimal field or some kind of a field that can hold a decimal place. And on hand quantity looks like it'll be an int or a whole number field. Plus, when you look in here, and I'll probably miscount, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. It looks like there are 16 records. Since there are 16 records, and each record has four pieces of data, there are 64 pieces of data currently being shown on the screen. Again, that should just make sense to you. So here's the concepts. Again, I think we've gone over all of these already. So I'm not going to sit and reread to you. But this is all stuff that should make sense more and more to you as we go on. All right. So how are da tables in a database related? Let's, rather than showing it to you that way, I'm going to try to show it to you a different way. And that is like this. So imagine that we've got information about an employee. So we've got their first name, their middle initial, their, their last name, their address, their city, their state, their zip, and their phone number. That might all, might all go into one table. And that would be personal information about an employee. Does that make sense? All right, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna add here an employee number. All right, and we'll add an ID as well. All right, now let, we, let's also assume that each person works in a department. So there's a department name. All right, each person has a salary, etc. So what I can do in here is I can decide, oh, what do I want to add? All right, well, this is going to have an ID too. And I want you to, if you look up on the screen here, this ID and this ID, those are not the same thing. They don't have to be. All right, now I am going to add emp number in here. All right, and now if somebody says, hey, I need a listing of all everybody by department. So I need your first name, your last name, and your department name. Well, I have to get information from two tables. Does that make sense? All right. It's going to be even more than this for this reason. If you look up on the screen here, all right, I'm going to have another table in here. So this might be, uh, I'll let you say we call that employees, employee personal. And we call this employee work. I don't know, I'm just making this up. All right. Now I might come in and have another thing with an ID in here, and it's got in here a department ID and a department name. Can you look at the screen on, on, on here and tell me why I might have done what I just did here? Anybody? Take a guess. I'm asking you this question. Do I need this any, anymore? Can I now just put in this? So if I've got thousands of people, again, 
Why should I be typing in whatever the department is thousands of times? Now there's just a number that I have to put in. All right. Well, let's look at this. I may decide that what I want to do is I want another table here that's got an ID, it's got a zip code, and it's got a city and a state. All right. You ever have that one? It doesn't maybe happen as much anymore, but I remember maybe 10 years ago or more, I would get phone calls all the time from telemarketers. All right. And that's when I had my home phone. And they would always say, hey, I just want to check your zip code. And if I gave them the zip code, they could tell what city I lived in and what state I lived in. So now by doing this, now I probably have gotten those out of there. So you see what we're doing? But if somebody comes in and says, okay, I want information from this table and from this table and this table and this table, I have to do what's called join those tables together. All right. And that means I got to be able to grab the information that I need from multiple tables. And I can do that because you'll notice I've got an emp number here and I've got an emp number here. I've got a zip here and I've got a zip here. I've got a department ID here, and I've got a department ID here. All right. Now, if somebody said to me, okay, I get it, but I want your first name, last name, and department name, well, when you look at this, I can't directly join this table and this table. These two tables right here don't have a field in common. That ID, those are different IDs. But I can go and say, join this table to this table, and then this one to this one, to give me the information I want. That's the kind of stuff we're going to be doing. All right. So either, and I see some head shaking, either that's starting to make sense or it makes no sense. But if it doesn't make a lot of sense right now, just bear with me because I think when you start to see it in action, the more you see it, the more sense it typically does and will make to people. All right, there's three different kinds of relationships you can have with what I just showed you. All right, and I showed you two of the three. The one table that we had where we had everybody's name, etc., and then in the next one, we had just the department they worked in. There was a one-to-one -one relationship. All right, and no jokes about Utah right here, but typically when we're talking about two people, are in a one-to-one -one relationship, that kind of an idea, all right? Now, you can also have a one-to-many relationship. I, there is one instructor to many students, that kind of an idea. And you can have a many-to-many -many relationship. Many students can take the same course. Many courses can be taken by many students, type of an idea. Now. Relational databases do not handle many-to-many -many relationships. All right? And you're going to see that as we go on here. Not only that, typically if you've got a one-to-one -one relationship, what it means is you've got a table that got so big that you split it into multiple tables. All right? What you want to have as much as possible are one-to-many relationships. All right? And if you remember what I just showed you, as an example here, all right, um, you know, we had first name, middle initial, last name, address, city, state, zip, etc., and phone. And we took that down and we put another thing in here with a zip and it had city and it had state. And I said, well, now we can get rid of the city and the state from here. But we're keeping the zip code here because it's, it'll, you know, so we can go and map these two together. Does that make sense? All right. And what we're talking about doing in here, the reason that you want to do that, and they mentioned it in here, is you want to be able to create what are, what are called, what is the word, foreign keys. All right. And a foreign key is when you take a field from one table and you put it into another table so you're able to join those two tables together. All right. And again, like I said before, if that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, just bear with me. 
because you're going to see it. We're going to start doing it. All right. So here's an example. They put invoice ID into here, even though it's not the primary key. But they put it in here so they're able to join the information together from two tables. All right. Okay. So how are columns in a table defined? Well, this is SQL Server. It'll be a little bit different in my SQL. The, the key takeaway, if you look on the screen here, is it's different. We're used to string, decimal, double, integer. When you think about it, those are pretty much the four types of data we've dealt with for the majority of this semester. All right. In here, notice a lot of times what you call it is either text or char. Not only that, there's char and there's varchar. What's the difference? Char is fixed length. So if I was to create a field called state and it was going to have a state code in there, I'd make it a char of size two. On the other hand, if I was going to put state and I wanted to type out the entire name of each state, I wouldn't make it a char because Mississippi and Iowa have got less, you know, they don't have the same number of characters. All right, so that would be a var char. The var in there stands for variable length. And there's all sorts of stories you can hear about that. You know, and over time, there's some variants. There's char, there's var char, there's n char, there's n var char. There's even varchar two, because in, in, in some, in, in at least one relational database management system, they screwed up the way that they set up varchars originally, so they had to make varchar two to fix what they screwed up originally. All right. Notice date time, small date time. That'll be different depending on the type you're using. Sometimes you will put, you know, month, day, year. Sometimes you put, might put day month year etc it depends on the type of system you're using floats and reels are what we have been calling doubles ints hopefully those all make sense and more and more of these are also allowing monetary types of fields which we've been calling decimal all right now a couple things about this because again these are terms you're going to hear what i just mentioned here those are data types all right and you can also, depending on, on what you put in there, you can, you can sometimes put in null. Does your field accept null? Null means unknown. I've used this example with you before. If this is your first semester here, until you get a final grade for any class that you're in, you don't have a GPA. Your GPA is null. It's not zero. It's null. It's unknown because there isn't one. All right. All right, columns can be defined with default values. Again, it's possible that if Rankin has some kind of a database set up, they may default the state to Missouri. It would make sense typically to do that. All right. What they call an identity column right here says a column can be defined as an identity column. It's what it is, is you can only have one of them for each table. It's usually the first field in the table. And in many, many relational database management systems, it's called an auto increment field. Do you ever see that? I, I, you know, I know checks aren't used as much anymore, but I remember at the old house that I was, I was living at when I was living in Illinois, that there was a sign above the gas pump that said, if you're gonna use a check, the check has to start with, line, with number 500 or more. The reason I'm telling you that is it's possible when you set up an auto increment field, you can have it start wherever you want it to start. I mean, how did people get around that? Well, give me a new, I, you know, I, I got a new checking account. Well, make my first check number 500. And that's, banks would do that for you, you know. All right. <clears throat> there are what are called check constraints that you can put in. We'll learn what those are as we move on in here. All right. So. This is how they're coming in and they're designing this database that they have. I don't think I can make this much smaller than that. But when you look at it, it's got what? One, two, three, four, five, six tables. All right. And you'll notice 
that in the customer's table, the invoices table, the line the estates table, the invoice line items table, and the products table, that one or more fields in each table, except for the order options, has got a little key by it. That means it's the primary key. All right, and this is the, what they've used. Don't worry, you know, when I mentioned before, we call it ID, don't worry, it'll start making more sense as we go on, all right? But you can also see some relationships. And when you look in here, it's kind of hard to tell. But if you look up here, that almost looks like a number eight. You see that here and here and here, et cetera. You see what I'm talking about? That means that's the many side of a one-to-many relationship, all right? So each one state can have many customers. And when you say a, a one-to-many relationship, the many side is zero or more, all right? It's possible that, let's pick on Wyoming. Wyoming doesn't have any customers for whatever this is. So it's possible, or, or if you just started something, maybe you don't have any customers at all yet. You haven't started selling something yet. So the many side means zero or more. And as you probably guess, you have to have a data type for each one of these fields. So what, invoices has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different fields. Whereas states has only two fields, all right? So they pretty much go over what I just went over. And, and again, with the eight in there, the infinity symbol, that's the many side. All right. <clears throat> says here, how to use SQL to work with a relational database. I'm just going to start going over this, and then we're going to take a break. All right. But it says in the topics that follow, you'll learn about four SQL statements that you use to manipulate data in a database. All right, notice select, insert, update, and delete. That is CRUD. In fact, much of the work that you, you guys will be doing in the fall semester, you'll be doing a lot of CRUD work. But again, they call it select, in CRUD it's read, they call it insert, in CRUD it's create. All right, and it's just has gotten that name over time. <clears throat> it says each DBMS is likely to have its own SQL dialect. What that means is the way that you write these statements can vary a little bit syntactically between what you do in one database management system and another. What you're going to find is since we're using MySQL and SQL Server, there'll be almost no differences. All right. So they start out by saying how to query a single table, and I've mentioned this to you already. When you ask the database for information, what you get back is what's referred to as the result set. So rather than going on in here, it's 8.57. Let's come back at 9.10, and I'm going to pick it up right here. <clears throat> 